Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. As beautiful as it is out there, so you got. Good morning. Good morning. Yeah, that's a little better. Let's all stand as we get started this morning. In that Christmas season, let's go tell it all about. It.
you're all doing well today. Uh, today for a community devotion, I wanted to ponder a question together. Uh, this question is, uh, what, what guides your decisions? What, what guides your decisions? I, when I was pondering this, I uh, was reminded of a story of when I was growing up. I, uh, I and my family went to 4-H and did a lot there. So my sisters were doing a horse show, and on the side for the little kids, they had this cowboy costume contest. And I got signed up, and uh, I, I loved it. Uh, my, uh, my uncle lent me his chaps, and my mom got this cowboy hat, and... Uh, I, I mean, whether or not I was going to win, I, I was really enjoying myself. I uh, actually always wanted to be a cowboy, so <laughs> this, is, this is my time to, to shine. At least, at least in my own head, I was loving it. So. Uh, but I got there and having a great day. It turned out I won that day. And, and uh, as a reward, I got a huge bag of Skittles, <laughs> which, which just made it all better. And, uh, and that was just great. I mean, uh, especially because the next day was my birthday, and I got another big bag of Skittles. <laughs> and for those of you who don't know, I have an insatiable sweet tooth. And it's it's a it's really a problem, but I, I really uh, can't get enough of it. So I started munching on those Skittles. It was my birthday. No one was going to tell me no. So I just kept on eating, kept on eating. And I was just enjoying the festivities like none other until about 3 o'clock. <laughs> and I puked my guts out. <laughs> and it was about all colors of the rainbow, I'm pretty sure. <laughs> it was just a very colorful pink. <laughs> and and uh, what, <laughs> needless to say, what, what got in my decision uh, to eat those Skittles like not stop uh, my sweet tooth? Like, and to get serious, it was a momentary game. I, I just did not stop myself. And, uh, and I did learn somewhat of a lesson just to pace myself with the sweets after that. But, uh, uh, you know, when, when asking yourself what, what guides your decisions, uh, you, you want to make sure you have the right guide. And sometimes we need a little perspective. I, th I think, I think a little perspective, just a little perspective out of the, the magnitude, the vast magnitude of God's truth, should be enough for us. It's it's such a vast truth that runs our world that just a little bit should be enough for us. And and uh, I actually have a visual illustration uh, that I'll grab. So we got here a line, uh, and this is this is from a good speaker in California. His name is Francis Chan, so you may have seen this before. But this right here today is representing time, and so we have here the beginning of time, what we know from the Bible, and here's here's Je here's Jesus right here. This is his life, the ministry on earth, and and this right here. Is going to represent your life and my life. It all fits in this tiny little, tiny little piece right here. And so, what I see from this is that, is that, what we want to want to guide our decisions is not only what we see in this little speck, but what we want to guide our decisions is what is to come after. So many times we can get caught up in what makes this comfortable. This little tiny, tiny little speck right here, what makes this comfortable? And what we read from the Bible is that there's so much more to look forward to, so much more to guide our lives than just what we have here. So, you know, I know you guys can't see the end of that yarn. It goes on and on. And what we have is a promise that this is going to be a good time if we pick the right guy. And so... Yeah, uh, whenever I was looking at a scripture to, to bring up, uh, I had a hard time finding one. 
And when that's the case, I usually think, well, that means pretty much all of Scripture can be applied to it. So what, what I have, though, is, is in Matthew 6, 24, he, Jesus, Jesus says, No one can serve two masters. Either you will hate the one and love the other, or you will be devoted to one to the one and despise the other. So I just I want to encourage you that that what we have ahead of us is a wonderful promise that can lead to an eternity, an eternity with a good and loving master. And so with that, I'll uh, pray for our community devotion. Father, I pray that we can choose the master that has uh, given us all he has and that has loved us unconditionally since before we, we were in existence. And I pray that we can have trust in him and we put our hope in him wherever we go and whatever we do. And I pray that you will be the guide to our decisions. And in Jesus' name I pray. Amen.
five frogs are sitting on a log. And uh, two of them decided to jump off the log. How many frogs you got left? Three? No, you have five. Just because they decide to do something don't mean they're going to do it. Make sense? This is Romans 12, folks. Just because you hear what I got to say today and you decide you need to do that, but until you do it, it really doesn't make a difference. You can make decisions do it all the time, but you got to do this. This is what Romans 12 is all about. It's real simple here. This passage, Romans 12, you know, the first 11 chapters of Romans, I tell you, it's all about doctrine. Doctrine, 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 doctrine. Okay? And then chapter 12, he says, okay, let's get practical. Okay? From here on out to the end of the book is practical. All right? Okay? Instead of doctrine, we're going to talk about duty. I like that word, uh, duty. Instead of doctrine and duty, instead of what we believe, it's how we behave. Instead of who we are in Christ, it's what we do because we're in Christ. That's what happens after Romans chapter 11, get to chapter 12, from there on out, to the end of the book. So what we've got here is 25 directives on how to be a Christian. How to let the world see us. How to manifest that into our lives. Okay? Now, I'll just tell you, Sometimes people say the Bible is not very practical. They haven't read this passage we're talking about today. This is so practical. I think this is practical for kids in high school, uh, grade school, high school, our lives, in our marriages, in the churches, in our society around us. This is how practical this is. Okay? And I want to ask you a question. What makes Christians different than somebody who's not a Christian? Let me tell you what I think is one way. Okay? Obviously... We say when we die, we're going to go to heaven. That's one way to say it. But here's another thing. I think one of the main differences between a person who's a Christian and one who's not is how we relate to people. And not just people in general, but how we relate to people who don't like us. People who mistreat us. How we treat them as Christians makes all the difference in the world compared to what the world does. Khrushchev was in, in the 60s, he was kind of the spokesman for the Communist Party, if you are too young to remember that, but Khrushchev was the, he came over here in 1960, and he, and he said this when he came to America, he said, the difference between Christianity and communism is great. In Christianity, when someone hits you, you turn the other cheek. He says, but Khrushchev said this, if you hit me, I'll hit you so hard that your head will fall off. Well, that's the nature of communism. In it. But that, guess what? It's also the human nature. It's human nature. Okay? You hit me and brother, you're going to get it right back. That's human nature. Okay? Here's what it says, starting in verse 14, chapter 12. You want to turn to that in your Bibles. Chapter 12 of Romans, verse 14. Bless those who persecute you. Bless and do not curse. Rejoice with those who rejoice. Mourn with those who mourn. Live in harmony with one another. Do not be proud, but be willing to associate with people of low position. Do not be conceited. Now, what I'm going to give you today is five <laughs> words for healthy relationships. Actually, I'm going to give you three, because I don't have enough time to give you five. All right? But here's the weird thing about this. I'm going to give you three right now, and a month from now, I'm going to give you the other two. So for a whole month, you're going to have to sit there in anticipation. What's the next words? What are they? I hope I'm excited, because next we're going to start talking about Christmas. Okay? Because... The season is upon us. And I want to make sure that we make it a big one. You know, I love Christmas. And you should love Christmas too. Because it's all about our Savior coming. But I'm going to give you three of them today, and then we'll do two later on. Okay? So just remember that we're not done with Romans 12. I think Romans 12 is going to be perfect for New Year's resolutions, by the way. Okay? So we'll talk about that at the first of the year. But the first word that I want to talk about is the word adversity. Okay? This is how you have a healthy relationship. You understand the, the word adversity. And, and this is it. How do you relate to someone when you're in an adversarial relationship with them and they're hostile towards you? I'm going to summarize it to begin with in, in this way. Be a blessing to those who hurt you. Be a blessing to those who hurt you. Yes? Are you ready for this? There are going to be people be people out there who hurt you. Okay? There are going to be people out there who treat you mean. Or 
who treat you with anger and hostility. And the Bible says when they do that, you be a blessing to them. A little girl wrote her preacher and said this, Dear Preacher, I heard you say that you are to love your enemies. I'm only six years old, and I don't have any enemies yet. But I hope by the time I'm seven, I will. <laughs> well, if you're above seven, you probably have enemies, don't you? If you're above seven, you probably have someone who's hurt you. Chances are you have a few enemies, and if you haven't got a few enemies, probably is because that, um, you know, maybe it is that they, you know, you're not being as vocal about your Christianity, okay? I mean, if you are vocal at all about your Christianity, people don't care for the way that you live or what you believe. Sometimes that can even cause an adversary, and mainly what this passage is really talking about. <clears throat> But basically, verse 14 is telling us that when people hurt you, you are to bless them. And notice there's also a, a negative part of this command. Not only are we to bless them, which is very positive, but it says, what? Do not curse them. Do not curse them. That's the negative part about that. Isn't it human nature when someone hurts you and somebody mistreats you that the first thing you want to do is just cuss them out? You just want to cuss them out? You just want to curse them? Sometimes people wonder what the Bible says about cursing. Let me tell you in a nutshell, do not, do not curse, do not curse people. That's in a nutshell what the Bible says, do not curse people. You see, God is the only one who has the right authority to damn anyone. You don't have that authority to damn anyone. I don't have that authority to damn anyone. God is the only one who has the right and authority to send someone to hell. You have no business whatsoever telling anybody that they should go to hell. You, you have no authority. So don't. Don't curse them. See, the Bible says you shouldn't curse them. Instead, it says you should bless them. Bless them. Let me tell you what that word means. It is the word uh, eulogia, which is, it means this, good word. That's what it means. It just means good word. It, is, it, it literally means to speak a good word even with those people, even to those people who hurt you. That's what it means. Okay, you know, I, I go to funerals and I have, on the deal, I have a eulogy day Martin. And what that means is I say something good. That's what it means. Say something good. Okay? Eulogy. It just means, it's just like saying, God bless you uh, whenever you get someone get tough on you. Okay? It, it is uh, it, it's kind of like this. It means you say something good about them even when they said something ugly about you. My mom used to tell me, if you can't say something good, don't say nothing at all. So your mom said the same thing to you. And there's another one of those deals where we decide to do stuff we don't normally do that. If you can't say something good about somebody, don't say something good. Don't say anything at all. Um, <clears throat> about every week we kind of work on that, don't we? All the way through our lives. I heard a lady in church who was uh, kind and positive. Uh, she always was that way. She always had something good to say about any, everybody and anybody. Okay, and one of her friends said, Betty, you say such good things about everybody. I bet you could even find something good to say about the devil. And she thought about it for a minute and said, well, you know, now that you mention it, at least he's always on the job. And that's true. Uh, you can say something about, good about anybody think about it a little bit. Okay. And that's the way we ought to be. We ought to find something good about somebody, even ugly people. Okay? Now, the word blessed means to say something good about them. Now, the Old Testament um, had something that was taught that was called equal retribution. Okay? Equal retribution or equal retaliation, if you want to call it that way. All right? And, and you remember what the Old Testament said? It said an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth. An eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth. Now, once you think about that for a minute, okay, that's pretty merciful. Okay? And it was an advanced moral standard of that time because we all know human nature. Human nature is not an eye for an eye, is it? It means this. is Tim, if you poke my eye out, I'm going to poke both yours out. That's human nature, right? Right? Matt, if you knock my te tooth out, I'm going to knock all your teeth out. See what I'm saying? That's human nature. All right? But the Old Testament comes along and it says, hey, I've got a little higher standard here. The higher standard is only an eye for an eye, and only a tooth for a tooth. Come on, guys. 
You know, this is equal retribution kind of thing. Okay? Then Jesus comes along and he ups the ante just a little bit. You heard it said, an eye for an eye, a tooth for a tooth, but I tell you what? Love your enemies. Oh my goodness. Love my enemies. And then he says, do good to those who hate you. Bless those who curse you. Pray for those who mistreat you. I don't, boy, that's tough. If anybody's out there as your enemy, you're supposed to love them. If they hate you, do good for them. If they're cursing you, you bless them. If they mistreat you, you pray for them. And then Jesus summarizes it like this. And this is where I kind of get that idea that we're different than anybody else. He says this, if you do good to those who are good to you, what credit is it to you? Even the sinners and pagans do that. You see, if you're only good to people that are good to you, then you're no different than anybody else. But if you're good to those who mistreat you, that's different. See that? That's how we're different. <laughs> Human nature says, I'm going to pay you back with interest. You know, what you did to me, I'm going to do more to you. Okay? And Jesus comes along and says, no, it's not equal retribution. He says, it's no retaliation at all. It's no retaliation at all. It's, it is blessing them instead of hurting them. And that's the first word when you think about it. Adversity. When you're stuck in adversity, then you do good. You bless them. You just bless them. Okay. You know, I, I, you ever heard of killing kindness? <clears throat> you know, it, it works. <laughs> it really does. It works. Think about that. Second word I want to give you is empathy. Empathy. All right. Verse 15. Rejoice with those who rejoice, but mourn or weep with those who weep. And here's how I would kind of summarize this word. Okay. Be sensitive to the feelings of others. Okay? This is really easy for guys. Girls have a harder time with that, right? <laughs> I'm sorry, I meant to say that differently. I meant to say it the other way around. Okay? Uh, this is where the guys have a little trouble. Okay? And I would say some girls have trouble with this too. Some ladies. Now, if you really follow this rule though, you're always going to be sensitive to the emotions and feelings of other people. <coughs> now, you know the difference between sympathy and empathy? Sympathy is when you feel sorry for somebody. Empathy is when you feel sorry with somebody. That's the difference. Okay? I can have sympathy, but when I have empathy, I'm having, I'm feeling sorry with you. Okay? Now, there's two extremes that he talks about here. He says, rejoice with those who rejoice. And then he says, cry with those who cry. Now, you might think it might be easier to rejoice with those who rejoice because, you know, you hear this word when it says, you know, when it says, uh, when you laugh, the world laughs with you. But when you cry, what? You cry alone. Remember that saying? You know? When you laugh, the world laughs with you. But think about it for a moment. When you think about this, sometimes it's hard to rejoice with those who are rejoicing. See, here's a person who's rejoicing because they have something good to happen to them. And human nature says this. Well, I'm not going to rejoice with you. I'm going to resent what you just got. Okay? I'm envious of you. I'm going to be jealous because you got something good happening to you, and I don't have something happening to me good. So you kind of uh, just get upside. And you're not going to rejoice with them. See, sometimes it's hard to rejoice with somebody, somebody else's victory. Okay? The Bible says that we're to do that, though. You find somebody that has a good reason to be happy, and I'll just tell you, maybe you're not feeling it that day. You know, maybe you're just not, nah, I'm not happy. You're happy, I'm just not happy today. I'm not having a good day, and you're all, you're all excited, you're having a good day. You know? And, and uh, uh, but, but here's the point. You don't impose your poor feelings on them. Okay? And that's what it means. Instead, you adjust your mood, and you say, yes, praise the Lord, I'm going to rejoice with you too. I'm going to rejoice with you. I'm going to be happy with you because something good has happened to you as well. I, I learned that kind of hard way back when I was at, at my dad. One time we were, um, I was all uptight about my friend Jeff getting married, and I was being all negative about it. And he said, and he just jumped all over me. 
Can he be happy with him that he's getting married? And I eventually was. I finally came around, and I was excited for him. But it was tough, you know, because, you know, back then, well, you know how it is. You thought about getting married yourself, and he's getting married, I'm not. Kind of thing. That's what it was. But that's how you do it. You, you adjust your feelings. Okay. Now, here's the other side of the coin, though. Weep with those who weep. This means you find someone who's really hurting, and you, uh, maybe you're feeling really excited right there. Maybe you're feeling really good. And they're hurting, and you've got to adjust your feeling to be able to empathize with them. See? Empathy. And, and, and you may not be feeling it. You, you can't have them adjust to their mood for you. Okay? Now, I need to make an exclusion here. <laughs> I mean, you know people. You and I both know this. There's some people who are just unhappy all the time. Mm -hmm. uh, you know what I mean? They're just chronic sad sacks. Okay? Mm -hmm. Chronic moaners. Chronic groaners, okay? And they're unhappy about anything and everything all the time. Okay? And I'm not talking about you going to like that with them. Okay? I'm talking about people. The Bible is talking about people here that have a real reason to mourn. Okay? They have a real reason to hurt and be sorrowful. Now those are the kind of people that you need to relate to. Those are the kind of people you need to come alongside. You see? I was interested. I, I do a lot do a lot of funerals and I Get it right and rehearsed. I mean, that's something I like to do. And then you got kind of rehearse and you see people pulling over. Those are people of empathy, in my opinion. People who have empathy for those that pass and they pull over and they wait for that group to go by. You know what I'm talking about? Some of them, some people don't anymore. And it always says, well, they're not very empathetic. What's going on? You know, but people pull over for that kind of thing. That's what I mean. You, you take the time. You may be really busy, but you take time to be empathetic. Okay, empathetic with them. All right. Now, <clears throat> the Bible says that we are to rejoice with those who rejoice, but we are to weep and mourn with those who weep and mourn. And I'll just tell you, you really have to be a real friend with somebody to be able to cry with them, don't you? You understand that? I'm not going to show you that very often. Okay, that's just the way it is. You know, we all go through times in our life. Uh, with the Tumi Cure Shed. And I'll show you a passage of scripture. It's kind of cool. Prop, or Psalms 56, 8. This is what God does when he sees prayers. Oh Lord, you number my wanderings. Put my tears into your bottle. Are they not all in your book? You know, God knows when you cry. You know that? Puts them in a tear vial. I read a little bit about a tear vial in the Civil War. These wives and mothers uh, who were back home would take these little little vials, and they called them tear vials, and they would cry. And those little tear vials, they'd fill up that little bottle, and they'd send them to the little soldier boy, their husband that was in the military, and just let them know that they care. You know, they're, they're, there you go. We, we care. We've been crying for you to come back. I tell you, all those people, all you guys that wept tears uh, of, of grief and pain and heartache in your life, they're not wasted. God has, actually has them written down in this book. Isn't that great? The best thing, this verse is saying, when you love somebody, you relate to somebody that is hurting, when they're crying, then you ought to cry with them. You ought to be right there with them. You ought to share the load with them as well. That's the idea. And see why it's so important. I, I, it's uncomfortable for me. My mom would cry about some student in school, and we're sitting there talking to her, and she starts crying. It's uncomfortable. <laughs> you know what I mean? But I come alongside her, and, and I I got it. You know, that's the way it is. Sometimes it's not comfortable. That's what we do, folks. That's what we do. Okay? You know, in Jerusalem, they had a, during the time of Jesus, they, it was very crowded in the temple. They'd go in the south side of the temple, and they'd go out the northeast side. And they just had a line. They just kept going through. That's how they did it, because that way they kept the flow going. Until one exception. And the one exception was when a family was going through this incredible heartache and sorrow, they would make them or ask them to go in the northeast door and walk against the traffic all the way to the south side of the temple. Why? Because they wanted all the worshipers to be confronted with the faces of those who were hurting so they wouldn't miss their pain. They, they wanted them to see that. 
those commercials on TV, the International Fellowship of Christians and Jews. You ever see that commercial? Have you seen that commercial? They have all these Jewish, older Jewish ladies that are in Russia or uh, Poland or whatever that are just look like they're just terribly poor. They, they do that so that you have empathy. For them. And you're empathetic. And make a donation or whatever you do and, and, and for them. That's the idea. I wonder how many times you come down branch on uh, Sunday you don't really look into the faces of the people around you. The eyes of people who see the hurt. Well, I guarantee you there are people here hurting. And you look at it or do you kind of turn your eyes to God or the one? I don't want to deal with that today. Okay? I mean, look around your Sunday school class or, or maybe someone on the same pew with you. I mean, look at their eyes. Or, I mean, you sort of just pass them by. Well, the Bible says you're to weep those who weep. And mourn with them the more. And I'll just tell you this. That's what I believe a true friend does. Really, a true friend goes to that depth of the relationship. I heard about a lady in Charleston, South Carolina. This true story. She went to uh, consult her grandmother because one of her contemporaries had just died. And the granddaughter said to her mother, I know that you're going to miss your friend. And the grandmother said, well, yes, I'll miss her. But uh, she really wasn't my friend. And the granddaughter said, what? He said, I know you spent time together, you laughed together, and, and you talked together. Then the grandmother said something that was very wise about relationships. She said this, well, yes, we talked and we laughed together, but we were only acquaintances because we never cried together. A true friend always shares tears. I think that's true. If you can hurt with somebody when they're hurting, that shows a lot, doesn't it? When you can rejoice with someone who's rejoicing, even when you don't feel like rejoicing, that says a lot. And that's what we do. Now you may have a lot of acquaintances, but you are blessed indeed if you have a friend with whom you can share your tears with. And that's what the Bible says to do. Rejoice with those who rejoice and weep with those who weep. See, you're to be sensitive to the feelings of other people. And that's really what it is. It's a, you want to call it this way, it's a duty. It's a law of being sensitive to their needs. It's a law of empathy. If you want to call it that way, that's the word. That's what Jesus did. You know, Jesus went, his first miracle, what did he do? You don't remember? Somebody. Turned water into wine. Guess what? It was a big celebration. They were all excited. They are having a great time. Jesus celebrated with them, and he turned water into wine. They had a big party. Got that great time. Okay. What was his last miracle? Anyone know? Lazarus. Lazarus. He raised Lazarus from the dead. And, and guess what happened? He goes into this town where Lazarus, goes right to where the tomb where Lazarus is at. And he sees Lazarus' sister, Mary Martha, and they're crying. Okay, Jesus came there late on purpose because he knew he was going to raise Lazarus from the dead. But when he saw Mary and Martha, guess what he did? He empathized with them and he wept. The Bible says Jesus wept. Shortest verse, almost the shortest verse in the Bible. I told you about that last week. Uh, but this is another one that I memorized. Easy. But he wept. He's showing his empathy. He's showing us an example of what he's doing. He knew what he was going to do, but he wept anyway, because that's how you get empathetic, empathetic to people around you. And the next word is harmony. Uh, verse 16 says, live in harmony with one another. Now here's how I can describe the uh, harmony word for you. Be willing to sacrifice your need to always be right. Let me ask you a question. And I don't want you to shake your head or nod, whatever you need to do. Do you know anyone who just has to be right all the time? <laughs> anybody, anybody, anybody come to mind? Are you here? Uh, my wife, I was afraid my wife didn't say, Amen! Uh, yeah, you did? You didn't say amen. You said it too quiet. You know I can't hear. Yeah, it's your fault. I can't hear. I, you need to talk louder. See, I'm always right. Can you imagine that? You can take that pitch down, please. Thank you. <laughs> um, I noticed that everybody else kind of did the same thing, but I'll tell you one thing you didn't do. Okay? I guarantee that none of you in the room thought of yourself. Am I right? 
I mean, you didn't think, I mean, honestly, did you think of yourself? No, you always thought of someone next to you. It's always their fault. Yeah, 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 it's them. It's always them. See, the Bible says a good relational principle is to live in harmony with all kinds of different people. You know, I was going to try some things today, and I, I put this all together. But you know, I, uh, I was listening to uh, harmony, really pretty music, and, and minor music. You ever heard the uh, songs played in minor? But listen to this one in minor song. Kind of scary, isn't it? <laughs> that is uh, uh, minor key. It doesn't sound good, does it? Well, that's why I think about when someone is just kind of out of harmony. Like, dude, you need to get in harmony. This is not working. Okay. You know, it's interesting because those keys are kind of, you know, they're just a little different on the piano, but they're, they're just working together and they come up that weird sound because they just don't get along. You know what I mean? Uh, they're very minor, very scratchy kind of thing. Okay? And I'll, I'll just tell you that as we kind of go through this, this is, uh, uh, whenever we live in harmony, it, it doesn't mean that we are just agreeing on everything. All the time, I mean, obviously we're going to have little disagreements, but there is an overall harmony that we have, okay? See, I think our desire is that we should want to make beautiful music together. We should want to be harmonious in the church. See, har harmony in marriage, harmony in the family, harmony in the church is so precious, so valuable, okay? Now, the role of the devil is to try to divide and disrupt every marriage in this church, every parent and child in this church, every relationship in every church. That's his goal is to divide us. And he does it with disunity, where we don't have harmony. And if you're not on your guard, I'll just tell you, if you're not on your guard, the devil will drive a wedge between you and your mate. He'll drive a wedge between you and your children between you and your brothers and sisters in Christ, period. The Bible says we have to be proactive in this. And sometimes we have to sacrifice our own desires. We always have to be right. It's hard sometimes. Just saying. But I think that's part of harmony. You know, there's one reason why we can be harmonious in this church, and this is this, this song.
Harry Jackson, brother Linda Hawkins, out of ICU. Uh, fluid one lung has a feeding tube because of difficult to swallow. Uh, keep praying for his walk with Jesus as well. Uh, my uh, uncle Duke passed away this last week. Had a heart attack on Wednesday night, and it was just inevitable after that. So keep that family in your prayers. Uh, joy, my aunt. Others on my left this morning? Yes, sir. Uh, I'm taking the ACT on Saturday. Oh, great. Everybody on their knees right now. That's all right. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, I was wondering what it's got to do to get membership of this joint. 
<laughs> well, you come up forward. Oh, you're supposed to come with songs over. You come on up. Come on up. <laughs> you know, I knew that you guys you have something different to say about it. Well. That's great. I love it. Well, guess what? Victor and Laura and Kyle are coming up to put their membership in Elm Branch today. Okay? So we'll let them do that. All right? I don't get over with it. Yeah, you know what it is. Let's just get it over with. That's why I love Victor. God, I love him so much. Uh, empathy. Empathy. <laughs> hey, you guys, I'm just going to ask you to prove if you still believe these tracks have been God. Absolutely. And I know you've been serving here and we continue to do that since it's here. So, praise the Lord, but let him be the first one. Empathetic with them. Uh, any controversy, you got to deal with it. Yeah, I mean, that's just the way it is now. The member is part of the body. Uh, you have to be nice to them now. I'm sorry. But yeah, that's just the way it goes. But anyway, praise the Lord. Thanks, guys. We're glad. We're glad to have you. And you guys, this is uh, a lot of neat things happening in the church, and, and that's the main thing. Uh, we see people that are. You know, but I, I'll say, uh, Kyle did a great job last week. And, uh, as people have said, college down is calling, folks, I believe. So we need to bring up that. I think it's for the notes or not, but during the, is it the communion time, we go up the, the uh, whatever the, our uh, mission for the month is, and we do that. It was uh, the uh, mission, this was Al Solzner. Al Solzner was our mission. You know what Al Solzner is? You might know. So, huh? Yes. Okay, but what, what, what do we do when we support this? What are we doing? Tara? I a scholarship to, well, a or a Christian college. Scholarship to Christian college is what it is. Um, so we get a couple of guys that are getting ready to do this. I know that uh, Jonathan has also been accepted at OCC. Uh, that's what this fund does. So, so that's why uh, I want you to think about that. Okay? Get these guys, help them in their education. Okay? What else? Can't think of anything else as far as announcements. Be here today. It's going to be fun. Good night. Uh, don't uh, don't make an excuse. All right? Don't find an excuse. Let's, let's all be here for that. I think we're done with all that. Anything else I can mention? I need to quit talking. It's 10 after 12. And I've still got stuff to do today. How about you? Okay. Um, God bless you for being here. We're supposed to just pray and quit banning yourself and tell me who it is. <laughs> <laughs> it's Preston. He's not here. Huh? It's Preston? All right. Let's all be standing, and I'm going to close in prayer in place of Preston. Father, we thank you so much for this passage of Scripture. And again, I pray that you'd help us to understand that this is so practical, that understanding that as we make a decision to do this, that we need to follow through. And Father, we praise you for this church, and I pray that you continue to protect us through your power of your spirit in this church. And I pray, Father, you guide us. We love you, and we praise you in the precious name of Christ. Amen. Amen.